has Purdue winning it all. Oh. So depending on how this kid does, I mean, so far, so good. He's got yeah. the two check marks. The rest of the year, we shall see. But Nostra he said Jack. that is going to be Purdue. We'll find out soon enough. Final four on Saturday as NC State takes on Purdue at 6.09 p.m. Alabama taking on the defending national champs, the UConn Huskies. And man, for the Huskies, the men's basketball team finally arrived in Arizona after plane issues. It delayed their trip to the final four. The Huskies plane landed after 3 a.m. local time. Their flight originally is supposed to leave Hartford at 6 p.m. Wednesday. That weather. All right, Hakeem Dermish holding down our HQ desk. We have no mechanical issues out in Arizona, nope, do we? No, Hakeem, take it away, fellas. Yeah, Jenny, you know what? Uh, the NCAA should have taken some uh, cues from our CBS travel department. We had no problems getting here. We are here alongside CBS Sports senior writer Matt Norland, former NBA coach of the year Avery Johnson, CBS Sports college basketball analyst Tim Doyle. We are on the ground, as is UConn. And really, the only thing that's slowing down UConn in this tournament, Matt, is travel. <laughs> what the heck happened yesterday? Yeah, no, it was uh, it was wild. I got a text message from Dan Hurley after I had landed. Uh, we were actually together. You and I were. Same flight. We, you got the you got the reporting life in real time there uh, that they had had uh, a snag with their plane, and so they're here now. But w what had happened was the plane they were supposed to be on was coming from Kansas City. It had mechanical issues. They were told it was going to be 20 minute delay, then a 30 minute delay, then a 45 minute delay, and then an hour long delay. Eventually, they realized they were not going to be able to use that same crew because of FAA regulations. They don't want to overwork the pilots and all of that. And so because of that, they got another plane to come in from Cincinnati. There was a hope they could leave by 1130 last night. That's not what happened. They had more mechanical issues with that plane. They had to just get some paperwork, and there was bad weather. They finally, I, I literally had UConn staff on the plane texting me as they were speeding down the runway to take off. 1.33 in the morning, East Coast time, and then they landed. They landed uh, 6.13 a.m. Eastern, 3.13 uh, Pacific. So they are here. And because of that, by the way, Dan Hurley will still have his press conference as scheduled. It'll be 3.20 local, about dinner time out on the East Coast coast there but the players they're going to practice and they'll come in for the CBS and Turner specialty shots but they there's no player media availability today there's no uh, Westwood One radio interviews today so some of the player stuff availability got pushed back until tomorrow which makes sense because as we do this right now I think they're all asleep I think UConn is literally they should be. as they should be but I think <laughs> UConn is, if they can they are sleeping right now except for one person Dan Hurley I promise you there is zero chance he's been able to sleep whatsoever Avery and if Dan Hurley needed any more motivation it's the, and we took that personally mean right like this is what he grabs on to. This will be the inspiration. Mm -hmm. Oh, we couldn't get there on time. And look, you can make the argument that, hey, why didn't you schedule your flight earlier? Why didn't you leave a little bit earlier? But in terms of what you've dealt with in your coaching career, have you ever had something like this happen? I had the exact same situation when I was coaching at Alabama. We were playing in the Big 12 SEC Challenge. Mm -hmm. So we were scheduled to go play against Baylor on an 11 a.m. game on a Saturday morning. So my brilliant self said, okay, we normally fly at 3 o'clock. No, let's fly at 9 a.m. in the morning so that we can arrive. I can practice, get the team in bed at a reasonable time. Mechanical issues. The second plane had mechanical issues. We didn't leave Tuscaloosa until 10 p.m. at night and landed at around 12.30 a.m. the next morning, got a couple hours sleep, had to play the game, didn't play our best game. I was about uh, to say, did you win? No, we didn't okay. win. <laughs> and I was really upset. So yeah. I said the next time we play in that type of a challenge, I'm leaving on Thursday morning. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> did you cover? Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's, a, that's where my head went eventually. Because yeah. these teams are such big favorites, right? I mean, everyone is expecting the, the inevitable that Purdue is going to play UConn on Monday. But when you are a double-digit favorite, and not only has UConn won, I mean, they have gone out there, Akeem, and they have covered every yep. single game by a massive number. So, Matt, great job reporting. There were so many nuggets there. I wrote them all down, and then your history of your team laying an egg, something to think about. Does that motivate you more as a player? You played at St. John's. You played at Northwestern, all Big Ten. Does that motivate you as a player like, hey, we had the travel issues. We're going to play harder. Uh, hard to tell. I mean, you know, I know you played a lot longer th th ago than I did. But, you know, you just go out there. You're so used to playing games. you got to get yourself focused. But when you get off that rhythm as an athlete, yeah, it definitely can mess with you. And mo more stories than not, 
the travel issues end up being an issue on the floor. All right, well, speaking of the players, let's break down the matchup. The player to watch for you, Tim, I'll go your way first. Who you have your eye on? Yeah, for UConn, it's Tristan Newton. Now, he was not great against Illinois. He only had five points. That was actually his second lowest total all the year. He had a donut against DePaul. You can have a donut against DePaul and still win the game because they're DePaul. But Tristan Newton's already had two triple-doubles this year. In a game at Kansas, he had 31 points. And to me, guys, he's the straw that stirs the drink for UConn. He makes everyone else better on the floor. He's able to get into the lane. He could drive. And the fact that he only had five, and they went on a 30 nothing run, it psh, psh, smacked around Illinois. That's how deep UConn is. I'll follow with that with Newton. Um, he's also a first-team All-American for CBS Sports. We actually uh, released that uh, here today on Thursday. So... Uh, UConn is so dominant and it's so good that it can get away without having its most important all-around player. It can still win. I mean, that's how good this team is. But in this spot, to me, I, I think they are going to task and ask their lead guard, their point guard, their header. You know, he's got this tremendous quiet confidence about him. To me, he's the guy to watch, not because I think they need him to do it. I think he's going to have a very, very good game. Like, I think when we get to the end of Saturday night, I am expecting UConn to win the game. And when we do that, we're talking about the all-time leader in UConn history in, in triple doubles. Uh, he Maybe he even flirts with that, but but I think he steps up big on this stage because he was also on this stage and wasn't the most important player a year ago for UConn, but he's been there and I'm expecting a huge showing from him on Saturday. So both of them are picking Tristan Newton. I, I've not heard a name that I'm hoping to hear from you. <laughs> well, I'm, R Rylan Griffin is my key guy All right, fine. in this matchup. I, I, I like him. That yeah, wasn't like the name him. I was and expecting to hear And when you look at Griffin, from. you look at Jaron Stevenson, yeah. those guys are kind of the all hats guys. That's what they call it at Alabama. Yeah. They do a little bit of everything, but the key is they make three-point shots. This is a three-point shooting team. Stevenson came off the bench. He was sensational. Yeah. His dad even played on the South Korean. Jared played on the South Korean national team, so that's in his genes. But with his size and versatility, both of these guys, I think they stretch the floor. They give Sears more room to operate. We always used to talk about teams that have post players that draw double teams. Alabama does it a different way. They create space. They can play five out, and they're the keys to their team playing five out. Grant Nelson is going to be very important if he can make some shots and play at a high level. So, and and players to watch specifically for Alabama, I'm looking at Riley Griffin. All right. Well, you know what? No one said his name at the table, so I'm going to say his name. Donovan Klingon. Kling Kong. Um, <laughs> Illinois was 0 for 19 on shots contested by Klingon. And there's more. Teams are 14 for 58. That's good for 24%. That's not good when contested by Donovan Klingon. That's the player I'm watching. 7-2, yeah. 280, Kling Kong in the middle. All right. Let's talk about the coaching matchup. And there's some some similarities here because Nate Oates coached under Bobby Hurley at Buffalo and now they're matching up in the final four so we're going to kind of go in full circle here Nate Oates went from being a high school basketball coach to one of the highest paid Dan Hurley the highest paid state employee in the state of Connecticut when you look at the coaching matchup how do you view it? First of all, when you look at this matchup, obviously I'll give Hurley the edge, but it's not as far as you guys think. Nate Oates has done a magical job uh, starting with his tenure at, at Buffalo and now continuing at, at Alabama. Now, sure, they've had a couple of hiccups in the NCAA tournament. I covered their game uh, two years ago when they lost to Notre Dame uh, in the first round, but they have a system, a proven and tried system. They love analytics. They don't really like the mid-range game. They are the threes are taking the ball to the basket. Uh, Nate Oaks has done a really nice job of getting Alabama to the Final Four for the first time in history. He, that says yeah. something. He, he's not your pick. No, but I'm still going with <laughs> Danny Hurley. But I, all I'm saying is, is not as far apart. It's not. There's not as much apart. disparity. Is what you're These saying. These are two terrific coaches. Yeah. I coached against Danny Hurley when he was at Rhode Island. He's always had tough, hard-nosed upperclassmen uh, players. He does a nice job of making uh, adjustments. They have a little bit more of an offensive package than what they get credit for. So. Um, I'm picking Hurley in terms of the matchup, but it's, it's close. Their, their practices are more difficult than the games at UConn. If you, if you were playing and you had the choice to go, let's say, Tim Doyle, you jumped in the portal and it was Alabama or UConn. Where are you going? Well, are you, 
are you are you are you, and not based on nil well, I because somebody's going to throw the bag at you <laughs> no absolutely and, and that's what alabama has done right I mean, they've really embraced nil depends what type of player you are right i think dan hurley's a little more all around and alabama's a little bit more on the offensive end i think the answer to this question i think there is a right answer i do think it's dan hurley think about growing up in the household with his dad, and you could argue M Morgan Wooten, you could make cases for other, but I think his dad's the greatest high school coach ever. 26 state titles. I also have in my notes, he ruined my senior night at St. Dominic. I don't know why we scheduled them for some reason. They came out to Long Island, psh, psh, smacked us all around, but uh, the answer here is Dan Hurley, correct, Matt? Yeah, but it's I'm right with Avery. I just don't think it's that drastic of a difference. Uh, two coaches, by the way, you know, Hurley also cut his teeth as a high school coach after being a player at Seton Hall, of course. Um, and, and part of this, by the way, I want to give a shout out to Luke Murray, who's an assistant for, for UConn, because it's Luke Murray who worked with Hurley to really completely revamp the way that UConn's offense runs. I mean, I had two coaches approach me earlier this season and say, hey, the story with UConn, and at this point, we don't know that UConn's going to be the number one overall seed, but the story with UConn was how did Dan Hurley just completely change his offense in like two years? Like what they're doing now, if you went and scouted the tape and watched how they played and then you looked at what they were doing in 2022, it's not the same team and not the same system whatsoever. A lot of that is assistant Luke Murray, who's done a, who's done a great job there. But a coaching edge has to go to Hurley. I mean, he is, oh, by the way, he is our, I'll, I'll break the news on CBS Sports HQ. Dan Hurley has won our CBS Sports National Coach of the Year Award, uh, which is getting published here on Thursday, and deservingly so. So he does get the edge. Um, he's got uh, a lot of different things that motivate him, but he's a sharp mind. He's a present mind. Uh, I can't wait to go to his press conference later today and see just what version of Dan Hurley shows up and yep. how, how many hours of sleep. But I, I think it is close. Nate Oates, a whip smart. He uses a system called HD Intelligence that helps with his scouting reports, and uh, he's, in, he's, he's, he's made sure to make this point. It is an important one to make. UConn has trailed for 28 seconds yes. the entire tournament. Alabama has trailed in every single game they've played. Uh, speaking about assistants, Kamani Young, yes. uh, the associate yes. head coach yep. for UConn, who I've been knowing for over 20 years, he's done a magnificent job. I think soon rather than later, I think he'll be a head coach. I, I agree. Just real quick on that, because I've talked to both, the, uh, both both these guys about that. They are in such a great position <laughs> that they can be a little bit pickier, but these are two future head coaches. And then the other is Tom Moore, who goes back to the Calhoun day. So uh, Dan Hurley has the best staff in the sport, and so if anything else, even if him and, and Oates, from a, from a true head-to-head -head X and O's perspective, if it's really close, uh, there's just no denying UConn's got the strongest coaching staff in college basketball. Tim, when you look at this matchup, What's the matchup you're looking at where the game will be won? Well, you talked about, you know, the player to watch. So I, I didn't use him in my player to watch, but the matchup is going to be Donovan Clean going up against Nelson from Alabama. And to Coach's point, he made it before. You know, is Nelson able to step out and make threes? He was great against North Carolina. He was two of two from three, but he's only shooting 27% on the year. Uh, Clean is just, you know, he's an eraser. I played against Greg Oden when he was at Ohio State, and he reminded Reminds me of that because you get in the lane, you're just like, w what are we doing right now? So I think this game is going to be pretty simple, guys. You, know, you see Kling just dominating on the inside. I mean, he had arguably one of the best games of the tournament against Illinois. He dominated every facet. Defensively, five blocks, three steals. He had 22 points, 10 rebounds. He's been everywhere. But can Alabama make threes? I think that's going to be the giant storyline. Because if they make threes, then this is going to be a game. They hit 16 of them. Against we know they're going to take them. <laughs> yeah, we know they're going to take. We know they're going to take. And them. you know what? It's not Alabama making threes. A lot of folks get caught up in that, and that's that's perfectly fine. It's the three-point attempts, right? Because when they've struggled, not only making threes, their attempts have been down. Yeah. So if you if they attempt 42 threes and make 18. <laughs> Connecticut's in trouble. So how do you try to minimize them to play more at the basket, finishing over clinging inside? That's the biggest thing because at the end of the day, every time you, they take a three, you think it's going in because they really take quality threes. They don't really like bad threes that balls are getting tipped. They want to mm -hmm. take quality threes. Yeah. Matchup for you. 
Okay, the big one for me is because it's, it's clinging versus the front court. Yeah. I mean, but you, you mentioned it, so I won't belabor the point. But that's that's a huge one. How Alabama somehow tries to get around clinging is the one. But I'll say this: How about Stephon Castle on defense and whatever he gets assigned to? Because Mark Sears has been, I think it's fair to call Mark Sears of Alabama a top. 10 player in the country this season and Stephon Castle is going to be capable in my opinion of being put on Grant Nelson or Mark Sears and so how he is deployed defensively because he's a really good perimeter defender we're talking about uh, a future lottery pick as far as I'm concerned so Klingon versus the front court is the thing that everyone's going to be watching for but the other one that might even prevent this game from being a single digit affair is if we see Castle assigned to see now they could have Cam Spencer guarding Sears, but like Castle can do a little bit of everything, and so his 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 multifaceted defensive pr approach, I think, is is the secondary one to watch. And guys, let me add one more thing. Against Alabama, normally centers have a hard time staying on the floor, mm. especially when they go to that Draymond Green small ball. So Ken Klingham and Samson Johnson have a role. Samson Johnson, 10 points off the bench in his last game. But normally centers are eliminated from playing against Alabama, which then hurts your last line of defense at the basket. So the more Klingham and Johnson can play in a game like this, can they switch? Switch and guard some of Alabama perimeter guys, that's going to be a big key to this game. UConn has led every game this tournament at one point by at least 30 points. Um, <laughs> this game's not going to be close. I'm just telling you right now, okay? It's, it's, it's uh, not going to be close. It's not going to be close. Ra you raise, your hand, raise your hand you? if you think UConn is winning this game. Okay, I mean, so we're all in you agreement. You can't pick against them. I I'm aware. Game. So that leads me to this. What has to happen, Tim? for Alabama to pull off the upset, the unthinkable, the improbable. You said 18 of 42 from three? Check. Yeah. yeah. That's what they need to do. They, and by the way, they need to keep shooting. Even if they, they here's the deal. They they lost by three Alabama to Creighton, and they were four of 22 from three. Now, what does Creighton have? Ryan Kalkbrenner. How many shots did he block in that game? Three. And they got away from sticking. Now, like, they got to learn from that game. Like, they shoot 30 a game, to Matt's point. Like, they're not shy. Let's not get shy in the final four, boys. Like, let it fly from deep. I totally agree. And, you know, this is the first time, you know, this year they've played in a dome stadium. So we'll yeah. see, you know, what type of effect that's going to have. Who knows? But um, they got to play their game. It's points in the paint with the layup game is making threes. Yeah. And then defensively, how many stops can, can – how can they slow down UConn? UConn's offense is outstanding. You know, can they get three out of five stops? And Alabama's <laughs> defense is not outstanding. No. <laughs> well, it's a major like, yeah. Think about this. UConn has not allowed a, an opponent this tournament to score more than 56 points. They have not allowed a 60-point score in any game. Like, they've had three yeah. games where they allowed 52 points. Yeah. So, like, I get it. It's, it's something's got to give where it's Alabama, the highest-scoring team in Division I, 90 per. But, like, the defense, that's got to play into your factor in terms of, of how Alabama even has a chance. you got to hope UConn's body clock never adjusts. Good luck with that. It will. Um, the defense has to – it's outside the top 100. It, it's just – we don't see teams that are that poor on defense. I mean, we had Miami in this spot last last year where it made the Final Four. Was a team outside the top 80 in per possession defense that Ken Palmer didn't break through. But also say Bama needs to make at least 12 threes, at least 12, at 40% or better on a clip. And it needs to hold UConn to the defense defensive standpoint. It needs to luck into UConn being sub 45% from the field shooting. Then we can have a conversation then if it can stay close. The only recipe is the threes and this. Alabama is 19-1 and one this season when scoring more than 89 points. The one loss was against Kentucky. Kentucky has a big man, big Z. Donovan Klingon, big man for UConn. We'll see it all go down about 20 miles from here. We're at the convention center in downtown Phoenix. Stones throw away from State Farm Stadium. Will we crown a champion on Monday night for all scores and highlights? Make sure you download the CBS Sports app, a bevy of content. Scan the QR code on your screen right now. By the way, QR stands for quick response. Scan that now and download the CBS Sports app.